Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. Today we introduce a new segment a series within our series where we're going to be taking a look at the work and research of current Wilson scholars and fellows. We're calling it our Wilson Now Scholar Spotlight and helping us kick it off is Maria Blackwood. Maria is a Title VIII research scholar with the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute focusing on Soviet Central Asia and her project is on capital relocation and the making of Soviet Kazakhstan 1920 to 1929 and Maria as you and I were just discussing before we began recording when we set up this interview we were talking exclusively about history but now current events have, have changed the calculation for us. Kazakhstan is in the news. Yes, it, it definitely is. Yeah, it's uh, uh, so, been an interesting couple of days. Yes, and, we, and we'll dig into those in a second. But first, tell us about your focus on this period, 1920 to 1929, why you chose that, and, and why it's I an important research topic. So this is um, part of uh, my broader research on the process of elite formation in the early Soviet period in Kazakhstan. Um, in my doctoral dissertation, I looked at the first generation of ethnic Kazakhs who became Bolsheviks and mm -hmm. made it into the party elite in the Republic. Um, so I, I looked at kind of who became a Bolshevik, uh, what kinds of people, what kinds of factors determined um, their success in, in their political careers, and um, how their personal histories and their personal relationships uh, shaped the political landscape of Kazakhstan uh, in the 20s and 30s. Um, but one of the very interesting things I came across in my research, and it really was something I stumbled upon, it wasn't something I was looking for, was the degree to which these people and their kind of personal concerns, and also the fact that there were so few of them, uh, shaped not just the political landscape, but the actual physical geography of Kazakhstan in the 20s. Where you put the capital and what you call it. Exactly. Well, what were some of the forces in play that led to, and there were three relocations in nine years, is that correct? Uh, so three capitals, two three relocations. Cap yeah, three, yeah. And, what, and, and what were the motivations behind those moves? So uh, one of the primary problems the Bolsheviks faced uh, after the Russian Revolution when they were establishing power um, in what would become Soviet Central Asia was that they had very, very few people to work with. So um, the Bolsheviks uh, had to be a little bit creative uh, with their ideology um, in the context of the former Russian Empire. So um, as you know, they were inspired by uh, the writings of Marx, but Marx and uh, other intellectuals in the early writing in the 19th and the early 20th centuries were definitely not expecting the proletarian revolution to take place in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, they were expecting it in a place like Germany, uh, which had an industrial proletariat. Um, uh, whereas the Russian Empire was this vast, uh, complicated, multi-ethnic polity. And um, the Bolsheviks had to get a little bit creative in terms of handling this diversity and the fact that there were all these non-Russians and non-proletarians um, across a very large territory. And one of the things they decided to do was uh, to give, to first of all establish what ethnic groups existed, and then to give each group that they decided met certain criteria uh, its own national territory. So in 1920, they created um, uh, the Soviet uh, Republic. At that point, it was called the Kyrgyz Republic for complicated reasons that I won't get into, but. Um, what we know now as Kazakhstan was established um, in 1920 as a, a Soviet autonomous uh, republic. Um, and because it was the Kazakh Republic, of course it had to be staffed by Kazakhs, mm -hmm. right? Um, but there were very few people who had um, the requisite qualifications. Um, before the revolution, uh, literacy levels were very low in Kazakhstan uh, and throughout the Russian Empire. Uh, so literacy in Russian among the Kazakhs is, is estimated at about 2% before the revolution. So small, a small field from which to choose. Very small. Um, and this, this uh, restricted their field for maneuver uh, in terms of uh, the people they were recruiting um, to fill the ranks of the party. And because they had um, so few people to work with, um, it gave these people um, certain privileges, you could say, and a lot of leeway. Um, on certain questions, especially in the early 1920s, when um, a lot of things were in flux uh, throughout the Soviet Union. So pre-revolution advantages translated to post-revolution 
uh, the environment. In, in a sense, yes. Yeah. So the people who became um, the party elite in the 1920s were um, predominantly people who um, were young. Um, they were born on average in the, in the 1890s, um, which gave them the advantage of not really having a political history that could be mm -hmm. problematic. But they, they had all been educated in uh, local, what were called um, Russian native schools, which were established by the Russian imperial government in order to create kind of a class of um, colonial uh, imperial functionaries. Um, so there is a nice irony there that uh, the, the Russian uh, imperial administration was actually educating the people who went on to become uh, the Bolshevik leaders of Kazakhstan in the 1920s. So that first capital was named? So the first uh, capital was in Orenburg, Orenburg. Um, which is a city that is now in southern Russia. Um, and it became the capital basically by default. Um, the territory that would become Kazakhstan was not really firmly under the Red Army's control until late 1919, 1920, mm -hmm. um, where, and Orenburg was kind of more firmly uh, under Bolshevik control. And it also had a history as, a, as an uh, administrative center for the Russian Empire. Um, but the problem with Orenburg was that it was um, predominantly Russian, ethnically, uh, and because it was a city, um, it did have kind of a working class and it did have a communist party apparatus at the local level, which was almost entirely Russian. Um, and there was a very contentious relationship between the city level party and the republic level party, uh, which was mostly Kazakh, which um, was, um, you know, people without this kind of long history in the communist party who had very different interests. Um, and even if they weren't Kazakh, they weren't from Orenburg. They had been sent there from Moscow. So they were thinking about Kazakhstan uh, as a whole. So those and are the, the, city the was, seeds um, of relocation. Yes. And, and then when is when is the move made and, and what is the, so the next capital? So the, um, the Kazakh Republic was uh, officially created in 1920, and almost immediately, uh, Kazakh Bolsheviks and the party elite started lobbying Moscow to move, um, precisely because of their contentious relationship with uh, the city-level party, and also because they, they said that, you know, there's nothing Kazakh in Orenburg. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't work as a center for the Kazakh Republic. Um, so they didn't, they, they made the decision to leave Orenburg first, um, and then they spent a, a good amount of time deciding where to move. It's like uh, moving yeah. without a job or an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Kazakhstan was this vars uh, vast, sparsely populated territory uh, that didn't have any major urban centers, so there wasn't any kind of obvious candidate. And for quite a bit of time, um, the uh, Kazakhstan-level authorities um, tried to convince Moscow that Tashkent should become the capital of Kazakhstan. Um, Tashkent is currently the capital of Uzbekistan. Um, and at that point, it was uh, being fought over by the Uzbeks, um, who did not intend initially to make it their capital, but who did want it um, to be in their republic, and the Kazakhs. Um, and the Kazakhs tried very hard. Um, they spent a lot of time and effort trying to lobby Moscow to move to Tashkent, but ultimately, it did not work out in their favor. And so they spent a lot of time thinking about um, what what a capital needs to be uh, in the context of this new Soviet Republic. And they thought about many different options. Um, ultimately, the criteria um, that they settled on um, through, through the course of very protracted negotiations and discussions um, were geography. So they wanted a place that was uh, more or less geographically central mm -hmm. um, for logistical reasons, um, more so than kind of symbolic reasons. Um, but more importantly, they wanted um, a city that could be construed as kind of close to the Kazakh population. So it's a place that could, could be presented as Kazakh in some way. Though by far the most important criteria and much more important than the other two was um, uh, railroad infrastructure. Because the best- Practicality, uh, uh, Exactly. Important. Uh, so their considerations were not symbolic, uh, which is interesting because um, this was a period of kind of concerted nation building by uh -huh. the Soviet state. And capital relocation is usually thought about in the context of uh, nation building. So- Well, when you're, the, you're, you're myth building too. Exactly, exactly. So for instance, even 
in Russian history, the move from Moscow to St. Petersburg under Peter the Great is very much about kind of redefining Russia and the Russian Empire. In Turkey, the move from Istanbul to Ankara um, was kind of a reaffirmation of um, Turkey as a secular nation state after the demise of the Ottoman Empire. But, so but the railroads trumped uh, mythology. Exactly. So interestingly, although this was a period of nation building, capitals were not thought about in that context. So they settled on um, a city that had been known as Akmechit, which means White Mosque, and uh, was renamed uh, Perovsk in Russian um, after the Russian military commander who conquered it in uh, 1853. And this was a small, kind of unremarkable uh, provincial administrative outpost that looked very good on paper. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it was more or less in the middle. Uh, and crucially, it was on an existing rail Sessible. line that, yes, that linked Tashkent to Orenburg and Moscow. Um, so and how long did that last? So they decided to make the move uh, in early 1925. Um, and almost as soon as they got there, they realized that uh, this was not going to work for them. Oh, for two. Yeah. Um, so they renamed the city Kizilarda, which means red capital. So it went from white mosque to red capital. Hmm. Um, and they realized almost as soon as they got there that um, because of issues with the climate and issues with infrastructure, it would be a very difficult place to live. So the city is right on the Siridaria River. Um, but despite that fact, there was a, a serious problem with running water. Um, there was no sewage system in the city. Uh, there was electricity, but only in the area immediately surrounding um, the railway station. There wasn't enough housing stock for this influx of officials. There weren't enough schools for the children. There weren't enough teachers. Um, and it was also, as they only realized once they got there, pretty difficult to keep the city supplied because there wasn't that much local agricultural or industrial output. So they had to bring everything in. So guess what, we're, le we're leaving. Exactly. And, and where to now? So um, because they were so miserable in Kizilarda, they decided almost immediately that they wanted to leave. In 1927, uh, they decided they were going to relocate to um, the city that was then called Almata and is now called Almaty in uh, southeastern Kazakhstan. And interestingly, one of uh, the major arguments um, for moving there was the fact that it has a famously pleasant climate. Um, the other major factor was the creation or, or the completion of uh, a new railroad line, um, the Turk Sib Railroad, mm -hmm. um, that goes down to Tashkent. Um, and uh, this kind of enabled the move. It made it logistically feasible. But uh, if you look at kind of the, the reports uh, that they were compiling at the time uh, on their decision to move, it's clear that uh, their kind of material comfort was definitely <laughs> one of their top priorities. <laughs> and why not? And why not? And then well, fast forwarding to today, we have a change in the name of the capital city. Exactly. So um, Almaty, uh, known for the Soviet period, and actually in Russia uh, still referred to as Almata. Um, was the capital until uh, 1997, um, when the capital of Kazakhstan was moved to uh, a city that has also actually Yet gone again. through several name changes. Um, at the time, in the 90s, it was known at, as uh, Akmola. Uh, in the Soviet period, it had uh, been renamed uh, Tsarinagrad um, after the Virgin Lands campaigns. Um, but so they, they decided to move um, to Akmola, which was then renamed Astana and uh, Astana means capital in Kazakh. Um, until and, uh, yesterday. Until yesterday, uh, when it was uh, renamed uh, in honor of the uh, now former president, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, and the capital has now officially been renamed uh, Nur Sultan. Um, and I think The last a, of the Soviet leaders. Yes. Um, Soviet era leaders. Yes. Uh, yeah, he had been um, in uh, important positions in the party um, in the 80s. In 1989, he became uh, the secretary of the party in Kazakhstan and then transitioned to becoming uh, president once uh, Kazakhstan became independent. And I think the contrast between the move from Almaty to Astana, uh, now Nur Sultan, uh, in the 90s, um, it's, a, it's a really fascinating contrast with the Soviet era uh, relocations of the capital that really highlights the difference between Soviet policies and um, the policies of Kazakhstan as an independent nation state. Um, because the move to Astana um, 
is, is very much kind of a nation building endeavor and very explicitly a nation building endeavor to create a new capital for the new Kazakhstan. Uh, but if you look at kind of the details of the motivations, it's almost an exact reversal of the move from Kizilarda to Almaty. Mm -hmm. So uh, when they moved in 1929 from Kizilarda to Almaty, they were motivated by the fact that Kizilarda was not a nice place to live, that had bad weather and terrible infrastructure. Um, and then in the 90s, when they moved from uh, Almaty north to Astana, um, they um, they kind of reversed that process by again moving the capital to a city that has a very harsh climate that at the time had a lot of infrastructural deficiencies. Maria, Maria you mentioned uh, uh, Turkey and other countries where we've seen capitals move. The United States has seen its capital move, not in recent times. Um, it is, but, but Kazakhstan, the story you tell is it's an amazing uh, vagabond capital city. Is this the, the outlier when you look around internationally or is this type of movement of capitals more common than those of us not in the know uh, are aware? So if I remember correctly, um, there have been, uh, I don't want to misspeak, but I think right. uh, 13 capital relocations in the past 50 years or so, um, including the relocation from Almaty to Astana. So the fact that it happened, uh, you know, that there were three capitals in the space of nine years is really extraordinary. Yeah. Um, it was not- That's what I would have assumed, but I, I wasn't sure. Uh, even looking at the Soviet Union, this is not the only instance of capital relocation in, mm -hmm. in the 20s and 30s, but it's the only time it kind of happened so frequently in such a short span of Some, time. Something else in, in reading the description of your work, uh, your project, uh, uh, it's interesting how multi-generational family connections established in the first decades of Soviet rule continued to be relevant to Kazakhstan's political, social, and cultural landscape, and that was before the outgoing president's daughter became speaker of the house and looks like she could be in the, in the line to potentially be a president of Kazakhstan. So again, echoes of the past in the present. And that's, and that's what I wanna end by asking you about uh, uh, this notion that history either repeats or rhymes. In the story of Kazakhstan, how do you apply that notion? I think um, in order to understand Kazakhstan today um, and also you know, its neighbors, it is very important to, to bear in mind the Soviet legacy um, these countries, Kazakhstan and the other um, former Soviet republics in Central Asia, have all you know, become independent uh, in 1991 and have since been very consciously kind of working to establish themselves as um, independent nation states. Uh, and it's a very important project uh, that they've devoted a lot of uh, mental resources and also financial resources to. Um, but I think it is important in order to understand where they're going um, to understand their kind of their baseline and the common experiences they have um, as part of the Soviet Union, uh, which were very varied. Um, but you had this period of really dramatic and often devastating uh, industrialization and uh, modernization in the 20s and 30s um, that involved a lot of institution building. Uh, and the if you look at um, a country like Kazakhstan today, it has developed uh, very significantly. Uh, since Oil the rich 90s. Nation. But at the same time, you see the way certain things are structured. It's very much um, a legacy of the Soviet Union, uh, which is not, you know, it's not good or bad. It's just kind of those are the models that um, it's built on. You see this, for instance, uh, in the metro uh, in Almaty, um, which was completed. Um, I guess they're, they're expanding it in the future, but uh, opened to um, riders a couple of years ago. And you see that the, the reference point is clearly the metro in Moscow, which is also true in Tashkent. The Tashkent metro is older, mm -hmm. but you know, the, their reference point is uh, the Soviet era uh, metro in Moscow. Uh, and I think it's just an example of um, the fact that despite uh, all of this ongoing change and evolution, um, there is still, uh, you know, the Soviet legacy remains present. I, I think I'm going to cheat. I think I said that was my final question, but I'm going <laughs> to ask you for one more quick thought, which is: Is the exit of Mr. Nazarbayev um, uh, is this a, a significant step forward in the evolution of Kazakhstan, or is it incremental? I think it's both. Um, <laughs> I think um, it's very it, it's it's very much a change, right? Uh, it's a very important change. Um, that also symbolically, came, it's certainly a significant. That came very unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no one... And it wasn't driven out of office by protests. It wasn't the typical scenario that we see in some of the neighboring states. So I think just the fact that um, he has retired uh, from the position of president, um, and he, you know, he's the only president 
Kazakhstan had ever had um, up until uh, two days ago. Um, I think that's obviously symbolically important. Um, it's also, uh, it, it means that there will be changes in the political landscape, but at the same time, um, he's not, you know, he, he's no longer president, but he's still very much present. Um, he's still, um, he, he still holds right. official positions. he's not completely positions. out of power. It's he's going to, to be um, the head of uh, the National Security Committee. Um, he has all kinds of powers associated with that. And he also has a special status uh, guaranteed by the Constitution as um, kind of the leader of the nation and the first president. And a handpicked Pakistan. successor and a daughter in a, in a very important role. Yeah. Okay, well, Maria Blackwood, thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. I want to ask you, for people who are uh, interested in your research, is there a plan for uh, a paper or publishing that, that will be accessible? Uh, yes, so uh, my project on capital relocation, I'm planning to um, publish as an article, and um, the remainder of my research is uh, all going towards a, a book monograph that will oh. hopefully appear at some point. Great, great. <laughs> well, for at least the paper part, wilsoncenter.org eventually. Maria, thank you for joining us. Thank really you. appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you for joining us as well. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for watching.